Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're reviewing some logistics of this talk first, and then we'll start introductions. We are offering this talk in Spanish. Speakers, we ask that you please speak slowly and one at a time to capture the translation. I'm going to ask our student assistant, Flor, to please announce and add instructions to the chat for the Spanish call line. Hola, buenos días. Si necesita asistencia en español, contamos con una llamada en vivo donde traducimos toda la información de la videollamada. El número de la llamada está en el chat. El número es 605-313-4434 y también ingrese el código 829406. Gracias. Thank you so much, Flor. We are taking questions throughout this session and we'll answer some of them at the end of the panel. Please utilize the chat on Zoom for questions or ask the Spanish moderator. This talk will be posted on our YouTube channel and Twitter account at UCLA Pritzker within the next week. A note on geography, we are based at UCLA in Los Angeles, California. Consequently, the majority of our work revolves around the LA County child welfare system. We understand people are joining us from across the United States and we'll do our best to share information that is relevant to all jurisdictions. With that in mind, we invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat. Please feel free to share your organization, your role and why you're joining this session. And finally, on this hopeful day for our country, thank you so much for joining us. We know there are many distractions facing us today and yet all of you forge on to learn more and do more for the children and families you serve understanding they are the future we need. Thank you so much for being with us. Now for introductions. On behalf of the UCLA Pritzker Center, my name is Taylor Dudley. You will see our production team, Ruby, Floor, Nicole, and Brittany assisting throughout the event. Please feel free to write them should you need assistance. Welcome to the UCLA Pritzker Center's Winter Speaker Series on Domestic Violence and Child Welfare. This work is funded by the Anthony and Jeannie Pritzker Family Foundation, the Van Nuys Charities, and the Blue Shield Foundation of California. We are pleased to co-host this event in partnership with the LA County Domestic Violence Council. Countless children enter foster care due to allegations of domestic violence in the home. Often these allegations result in a finding of neglect for failure to protect. Yet removing children from their homes and placing them in foster care for an isolated allegation of domestic violence can result in further trauma for both the DV survivor and the children and in other harms, particularly in diverse communities of color. Our work examines this dilemma and the import of child safety coupled with the challenges of family separation. With the support from the foregoing foundations, we have been engaged in research over the last year to explore the gaps in policy practice, training, data collection, and cultural competency where domestic violence and foster care merge. This series highlights four areas where that intersection is particularly relevant. This is our third session in a series of four. This session will explore how domestic violence comes up in classrooms and what educators and school personnel can do to support and serve the whole family. Questions around mandatory reporting and the connection between social services and education will be discussed. Our learning objectives for the day include understanding how DV comes up at school for kids and families, learning how educators and school personnel become engaged to support and assist families facing involvement with child welfare due to domestic violence and exploring complications that arise due to mandatory reporting and other systemic requirements. We will now turn to the panel discussion. As a reminder, we are taking questions in the chat, which we will compile and possibly address. This panel is moderated by Eve Sheedy, an attorney and the LA County Domestic Violence Council Executive Director. Information and contact information for the Domestic Violence Council will soon be in the chat. Eve, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. On this um, day of new horizons, and uh, thank you for being here. We have a wonderful panel, so I'm going to be very quick. I just want to give you a very slight overview of the Domestic Violence Council and invite you all to join us. The Domestic Violence Council is two things with the same name. One is the county's domestic violence coalition that's made up 
of uh, survivors, people who work in the field, people who work with people who cause harm, people who are interested in DV, anyone in the public who's interested in joining us. We operate a number of committees, including policy, it's all related to DV and policy, religion, healthcare, LGBTQIA, um, uh, systems improvement, and we have a domestic violence child welfare committee. You're also welcome to join any of those. We put out a daily email with information relevant to what's going on within the council, in the county and nationally. I will put an email address in the chat when I'm done speaking. You can sign up to get that daily email. It will also give you um, the uh, address of our website where you can see our calendar. And we also run a hotline um, that is available in multiple languages on our website. We have resources available in multiple languages. So um, I invite you all to join us. So with that, I am going to ask each of our wonderful participants uh, today, where we're talking about domestic violence and education, to introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with uh, Christine Shen. You want to go ahead from the UCLA Man Community School. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Christine Shen. I serve as a director for the UCLA Community Schools Initiative. We have two sites, one in South Central LA and one in Koreatown. Uh, we predominantly support students that are designated as 100% Title I. And in South LA, we have a unique population um, because it's around 40% of our students are in and out, out of home placement at any given time, um, which means uh, foster care, um, out of home placement, um, or they're not living with their family, or, or they're homeless. So the reason why this topic is so important to me is that our focus at both community school sites, it's really to provide a safe environment for our students so that they can learn. And we understand that many external and internal factors affect that. And we have seen um, violence both at the family level and also between peers at the school site. And we're always trying to figure out ways to support and help students kind of mitigate that and develop strategies and tools to support them. So this is a super important topic. While I uh, support at the high level and I have, um, I work with staff at the school level to really support students, it, it's, um, it's just so critical. Thank you so much. And so I'll move now to Trisha. Can you introduce yourself, please? Good afternoon. My name is Trisha Gillikin. I was the former restorative justice uh, advisor for Horace Mann UCLA Community School. I was actually on the campus for roughly five years. I have recently taken a new position within LAUSD as a systems of support advisor. But um, I worked hand in hand with Christine around our student issues and our student populations. And one of the reasons why this topic is so important to me, I believe is because my position and my role on the campus was to help build resiliency for our students while encouraging them to stay in school, continue their education and bring resources that would benefit them and their families. Thank you so much. Um, turning now to uh, LAUSD, uh, Pia Escudero, would you introduce yourself, please? Yes, good afternoon. I'm so pleased that Christine and Tricia are here from LAUSD as well. I have the honor of being the Executive Director of Student Health and Human Services. I started in LA Unified over 30 years ago as a psychiatric social worker. And about 20 years ago, we joined in partnership with RAND and UCLA to look at trauma in schools. And the 20 years I've been doing trauma work um, in the school district have been really swimming upstream to really define what trauma is and how it impacts our children, how prevalent community violence is and how prevalent trauma is in the life of students. And today, after experiencing COVID-19, the reckoning of our nation and really having a universal um, umbrella where our children and families have experienced uh, trauma in numerous ways, how relevant that work is 
and that lens is when we speak about schools and making them safe and bringing um, just uh, Tricia mentioned the, the resiliency, knowing that not all our children are um, receiving the right supports so they can thrive. It just makes our the complexity of our work very vivid. Um, the reason why I'm interested in this topic is because I think as professionals, we have to really think about the discernment that we will um, have to practice when we welcome children back to schools and we create these environments that are truly safe so that they can thrive and not really use the pillars and systemic um, uh, resources that we've had in the past so that uh, we really focus on strengthening families um, and addressing all the traumas, all the griefs. I don't think we've ever been in a situation where we have to look at our work in a very unique and very strategic way. And I think together we can find solutions um, so that it, it works best for our children and families. So um, thank you. I oversee social workers of over 2000 staff, um, nurses, uh, and we provide a whole array of basic needs and mental health services in, in the school district. And it really the honor of leading during this time has just elevated um, the resources that we've built in the last decades, but uh, really looking at um, partnering with others and figuring out how to do this the best way we can is critical. So thank you for inviting me today. Thank you so much. Uh, we're all facing new challenges moving forward. Um, we're now traveling out to the Antelope Valley to the Lancaster School District. Uh, Dr. Michelle Bowers. Good afternoon, and uh, again, thank you for inviting me and members of our team to join you this afternoon for this very important discussion and this very important topic. We are uh, very concerned. I, I will just say from my lens, we are an elementary district. We're in the far northern region of Los Angeles County, but we are facing some unique challenges in that we have a very significantly high percentage of homeless families that we serve. We have a significant, significantly high percentage of foster youth that we support in, in the Antelope Valley. Uh, and we are unique in that manner because when I say significantly high, we're close to 10% between those two populations uh, just in this little pocket. So uh, as I think about the importance of this conversation and the fact that we are an elementary district we are charged with making sure that we look over our little ones because we can't, there is so much trauma and especially in light of the, the pandemic um, and domestic violence reports, child abuse reports, neglect reports uh, or non-reports, we, we know that it is happening. We know that just because there is a pandemic and the stay at home order that that has exacerbated um, this problem in many ways. So we're here because we care. We're here because it's important that the entire audience in our communities know that this is a real problem. We have to give, we're here because we're a voice for these children that need a voice, that need help, that need resources, that need support, that need a safe space and schools have been um, that safe place for them. So I'm pleased today to be joined by two members of the team. And uh, Eve, I'm just going to go ahead and toss this ball, if you don't mind, to our Director of Pupil Safety and Attendance, and that's Julie Usler. And Julie, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Michelle said, I'm Director of Pupil Safety and Attendance, and very proud to be that. Um, it, it's wonderful in my department, and I uh, can relate to Pia in that we not only have our mental health services within my department, but we have health services. And so working together, um, I really feel like we can surround the whole child. Um, you know, one of the things that I've always been interested in are the students that don't typically do well in school. Um, that has been a real passion of mine throughout my um, career, even before getting into education. And um, looking at those students and working with them as closely as I have, not only through, um, you know, being a middle school principal, but working with our community day school program, and now, um, you know, working expulsion panels and really trying to get to the core of what it is that's causing the student not to be able to access what it is we're offering them. And many times in having conversations with the families, 
we find that, you know, there, there is violence in the home. There has been trauma in the home. Um, there's been ongoing issues and, you know, oftentimes substance abuse, which also leads to domestic violence. And so, you know, it definitely has been something that, you know, through the years I've, I've seen over and over again. And if we can work on putting systems in place that can address that trauma, can address what's happening in the home, um, you know, e even before they get to school, um, that I think will help us really meet their educational needs in a, a better way. Um, I also work with Trish, and she's going to get the ball next. Um, as the foster liaison, it takes two of us. Um, you know, Trish does most of it. I'm going to give her, you know, props for that. But it, it takes two of us to actually manage the foster students and foster families that we have in, in our district and make sure that we're providing them with as much um, support as we possibly can. Um, and that oftentimes comes down through not only our administrators, um, oftentimes our, our health services workers, but for sure our counselors and our counseling department. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Trish, and she is um, my coordinator extraordinaire of um, counselors, climate, and culture. So Trish Wilson. Hello. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, yes, I am the, the coordinator of climate, culture, and counselors for the Lancaster School District. It's a mouthful. Um, and my role is to oversee the counseling program in addition to mental health um, services in our district and social emotional learning. Um, so, you know, as educators, we're responsible for the whole child and um, not just teaching them academics, but also caring for their social and emotional well being. So, um, that is the reason that I'm interested in this topic um, because anything that affects our families affects our children and their learning. So, um, we work. We work a lot with our families um, in order to give them the tools that they need to be effective parents um, so that we're able to have a partnership in educating our kids. So um, as the foster liaison, I also um, you know, am involved with, with, with students that are placed in foster care because of domestic violence um, and um, are experiencing trauma in many different parts of their lives. So we have to um, find ways to mitigate that and to support our students. So thank you for having me. Thank you to all of you. It's an incredibly impressive group and thank you for joining us. So our first question has uh, three parts, but I feel good talking to educators. You're used to the getting the questions right. So how does domestic violence or intimate partner violence at home come up among your students? And what do you do when that happens? And what is the impact of mandatory reporting on that? How would you handle that? And I will start uh, with Pia. If you want me to repeat it, I can do that. As no, well. I've got it. Thank you so much. I just think it's a, it's a deep question because how it shows up and how we respond as a system may not be the best as we know it today. For us, it depends on the age of the child, but we see children in early education, elementary schools, middle schools, and high school demonstrate different ways of reflecting when there's violence in the home. Very young babies, we see that um, they have a difficult time integrating, a difficult time regulating, um, and the reason why I say that as a system, um, not always are we able to discern when it is domestic violence or there are ACEs in the home, right? And, and uh, this concept of really sending children to special education or referring children out, right? Instead of really figuring out what's going on, sometimes an educator is not able to, to really discern um, what is going on. I think there's a, a question here. Um, about mandatory reporting that I wanna address head on. And I think it is the complexity of all these systems at play. As educators, and you can imagine today, virtual setting, teachers are trying to just log on and do their lesson planning and really teach and high, have high expectations. When behavior gets in the way um, and there's a question about um, abuse or domestic violence, it is something that teachers have to report. 
That's not something that we can wiggle. There's no room. And anytime any of our employees have a question, should we report, should we not? Our general counsel and everybody is trained us to say report. So I think to ask anything different for the educational system is not a realistic ask. And so I'm jumping into a very deep question because I believe that, um, and I've had a chance to really think about this to, to show up today and talk about this. I believe that there's a question for DCFS here. How do they have a, a line for teachers to meet that mandate and for DCFS who are experts to discern what it involves um, a different type of investigation of a family? Because I, I always hear that more pressure is placed on teachers. Teachers should do this, you know, they should do that. And if there's ever a time that we've looked at the complexity of teaching and having high expectations, allowing children to have a voice and engaging children in learning, and then also address hunger, poverty, trauma. I mean, that is just way too much to ask for teachers. So I wonder if as a system thinking and an ability to um, really think about this, how do we support that teacher to meet that mandate? Because as a school district, I've also had experience when we haven't reported, right? We had a, a huge situation that I was there every day at Miramonte Elementary School of something that was not reported. And the, the, the responsibility of a school to report really comes down heavy. So how do we alleviate the role of a teacher and provide support to that teacher so that we can engage children in learning no matter what the barriers are? So I took the conversation a little bit um, differently because I think we can all say how this uh, um, reverberates in the classroom. In high schools, we see um, students engaging in unhealthy relationships, we see it. But then at the same time, the educational mission is to give our children that education they need so they can thrive. And we really have to support teachers so they can teach children. And so. I think the question is how do we partner with school districts and with families um, so that we can do this work of, of really um, maximizing each child's potential. Thank you so much. Your perspective and understanding of the, the combination of these systems and how they impact individuals and families is really critical. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Julie and Trish. Do you wanna choose who's gonna respond? I'm not or both of you? I'll start, but then Trish needs to be able to piggyback. Um, you know, I, I agree that a lot does fall on our teachers because they have that personal relationship with the students. And it's through having that relationship, that's the only time that you're going to get students to you know, talk to you and tell you about things that perhaps might end up um, resulting in some kind of you know, reporting that we're mandated to do. Um, we've also put counselors on every one of our campuses, which I think is absolutely critical um, in having that, that other person um, so that, you know, we do have someone else that's there that's trained, um, you know, to talk to the kids. Uh, a lot is going on and, and Trish has been working with the counselors in order to put things in place um, that make them accessible to the students as well. So even though it's only one of them on the campus, they do lunch bunches and they go out and they um, you know, play with the kids at recesses and they have um, different types of, of you know, games and things that are going on. And even now during distance learning, um, they're continuing to do their lunch bunches. They're continuing to make those connections with kids so that if there are issues in the home, if there are problems, you know, there's a trained person, a trained professional um, that the kids can have access to in addition to you know, their teacher or another trusted adult on campus. Um, we've also been working, and I know um, our local DCFS has been working um, very hard to put um, connections in place. And Trish and I have been attending meetings where, um, you know, we've been working together and, and being able to put faces with, with names of the people that work in our local um, child welfare offices so that we have connections. And um, I think that makes a big difference. And you know, working to get some social workers on campuses that are helping as well. So, you know, as, as many people as we can put out there as possible in order to help, you know, hear what, what students have to say to us and, 
help them with maybe issues or problems that they're having at home. And I, I do believe that mandatory reporting is just that, it's mandatory. If we hear about something that's going on, um, we have to report it. And so we have to be able to also trust that the rest of the system is going to pick it up and do the right thing with it, you know, and, and then be there as the educational entity to help support the student, um, you know, if there needs to be intervention in the home. And, you know, I, I don't know, you want to add anything to that, Trish? I know that's... I think you covered it pretty thoroughly. Um, I agree with Pia that with the little ones, they, they show what's going on at home through their behavior. And, um, you know, a lot of the time, kids that are extremely aggressive at school are modeling, you know, that what they've learned at home. And so, um, you know, I, after we find out, you know, what, what is going on in the home, their behavior makes a lot more sense. There's always reasons for it. Um, but you, we really are, are just um, making sure that we, we, we educate our staff. Of course, they have the annual child abuse reporting every year and um, making sure that our staff is equipped to look for, for the signs. Um, and when the students confide in them, um, which they often do, then they make those reports. Um, and that's the way that we protect our, our children that really can't protect them themselves. One other little add on, um, just, just some of the proactive things. I know that you know we we want to be able to address you know what's going on with the students, and we're working really hard to make sure that we have um, you know really strong social emotional learning um, components within our our daily and weekly um, lessons within the classroom, um, and making sure that we're offering some training for parents and families. And so again, um, not only before the pandemic, but also virtually now after. And what's interesting to us is that we're actually getting more participation virtually um, than we did when we asked people to come in. So I think we're kind of learning some new ways of, um, you know, even operating after this is, this is all passed um, in that, you know, we find, you know, a, a multitude of ways to try to reach our families um, in order to give them the tools they need, um, maybe to head off um, any type of violence within the home. Thank you for reminding me about that, Julie, because we have um, our counselors have offered a series of caregiver trainings this year. Um, and some of those topics include um, self care for parents, stress and coping, um, and physical and mental well being during the, the pandemic. And I think that through these trainings, we're giving parents tools so that they um, are able to cope with the stresses at home that, that are um, the result of the pandemic. So I think that those those have been very well attended. We record all of the sessions and we make those available on our website um, in Spanish and English. So it's on the Lancaster School District website if anyone wants to check them out. Thank you, Tricia. Um, if you wanna add something to this question and maybe address a little bit about what might be the difference in um, with children when there's DV at home versus when there's an allegation of child abuse, if that, uh, how that plays out. Okay, sure. Um, you guys all covered so much and it was really excellent listening to you guys because I noticed a lot of similarities about what we do in LAUSD, but then more specifically at Horace Mann. Um, really fast. Um, just to paint a picture, Horace Mann is a very unique setting because we've known our children since they were in sixth grade. So they really kind of grew with us, right? And so we have our first graduating class of seniors in high school. So we've known them at the start of that adolescence turmoil, if you will. So we have really built that relationship. And a couple of you guys had brought up the whole child aspect. And one of the things at Man UCLA Community School that we've really tried to do is look at that whole child and everybody that's in that child's life, right? And building those relationships, not just with the child, but with the house also, the people that are there, right? Because some of our students, you know, we've seen some of our students on um, get sent to foster care because of a report. And then we've seen some of our high school students unfortunately transition into being homeless and then going through that process and really trying to build that relationship with all stakeholders that are involved with that child. Um, 
one of the things also that we did is on um, my work as restorative justice advisor um, at Horace Mann was really looking at what our community needed, right? Not just within our own school site, but our community as a whole and how we can support the whole of our community. And one of the things that we looked at was um, one of the groups that I had started was straight up mentoring. So these are our students that show up to school every single day, you know, that are gonna pick all the buttons or push all the buttons for that teacher to get sent out of the classroom. And so what we really did was um, we partnered with UCLA Bruin Corps and then some of our uh, students that were in a legal class trying to be either become social workers or lawyers and really partnered them with a one-on-one -on -one mentor, right? So we were looking at educating our students, educating our teachers, and really educating the outside staff of how to address the needs of that child. So we really took a holistic approach when we were uh, putting together our programs. And then one of the other groups that we had was our girls group. And so this was predominantly our girls that were um, our highest expulsion rates, or not expulsion, excuse me, our highest suspension rate students, the girls that were gonna be sent out of the class within a couple minutes, but these were also our girls that we knew had a situation going on at home. So we pulled them out during advisory class and really built that trust and that relationship with them. So man was unique in the fact that every student had an adult on campus that they could go to if they needed to, right? And so one of the big pushes at MAN was that we built on um, community and all of our teachers were trained in community circles and restorative practices. So really understanding and creating that safe place that every child belongs was huge for us, right? So then if something did come up where it was a DCFS report that had to happen, the student knew ahead of time, it was a safe place to share, but our main goal was to protect that student. It had backfired a couple times, unfortunately, um, because of the fact it's like, there's that line where they wanna tell you what's going on at home, but they don't want the, the consequences for those actions. You know, they're not asking to be removed from that situation. And I had a student that unfortunately uh, was involved in a domestic violence situation and she shared that it had turned on her. And she was at the end of, the, or the receiving end of the domestic violence. And I had to call DCFS and I had to keep her at school with me. And by the time she was released and it was cleared for her to go home, the father was removed. So then she had come back the next day angry at me because I messed up her home environment, right? So then having to pick up those pieces and reassure her, this is a consequence for his action and it's not reflective of you, you know, and then I don't want to say the trust was broken with that student, but it was the relationship was damaged at that point. But also because our uniqueness, sorry, my computer just glitched for a second, because of our uniqueness to our campus, there was another adult that could pick up the pieces and reassure that child that she was still cared for and she was still loved for on that campus. Christine, did you want to add anything? I think I kind of went like full circle on that. Christine, you're muted. Trust is such an important part of supporting our students and families. And I think, you know, Trish talked about it a lot. Like all of the kids acknowledge that there, there is at least one and for many of the kids, there are more adults on campus that they can go to to help them problem solve. And that was a big component of really create, not only like bringing resources to schools to help our kids, but helping our kids see that these individuals are people that they can trust and they can trust to help them because they don't always have those individuals in their immediate uh, life. And so that takes a lot of bridging, so. Trish has been amazing. She's done a lot of work at the site. Thank you so much. And I wanted to emphasize, I think my, my, my biggest uh, priority right now is to fortify and support parents. When it was mentioned, we have opened up uh, parenting sessions. We've had over a thousand parents 
join our Zoom meetings and hungry to know how to be able to help their children, how to calm themselves, how not to be, uh, to break the cycle of violence, how to be regulated, how to be mindful. And we're, we're holding um, a, a, a new a parenting program that is trauma informed, but yet addresses disciplinary um, mm -hmm. expectations because parents are confused, you know, about uh, am I not able to discipline and, and how do I go about a trauma informed, they really do want to be mindful. And so I think coming from this lens that parents are the experts and they are the, the ones that want the best for children. How do we fortify them? I'm, I'm really concerned with um, our division. It has uh, wellness centers and, and we have clinics. Um, I've been thinking, how do we team up and how do we set up um, systems where parents could have respite care or have after school programs? Where are the activities where children can be really socially uh, come back to our society in a way that are, are feeling um, supported. I, I, I don't know, I'm very old school and I'm, I'm getting older, but I grew up in, in Los Angeles before Prop 73, of, uh, before Pro, uh, Prop 13, where parks were available. I was able to take classes and I had summer school and I had summer enrichment programs. I think we really are burdening our families with so much stress and so much anxiety, especially today with, um, when there's poverty and access to healthcare. And I think that um, really empowering families to have this knowledge, uh, as was mentioned, tele, uh, uh, Zoom and having virtual meetings with families has been very successful. And we have ways of translating to multiple languages at the same time. And so just coming with this thought that the families are the ones that, that are experts and we need to fortify them is really important with the school as a partner as well. So I just wanted to mention that because I see the strength of families and they just need um, assistance and they're begging for help right now. Thank you. Um, there's a couple, most of the questions will lead to the end, but there's a couple of specific questions. One is uh, where uh, to get more information on the parenting program and if it's open to everyone. The other is uh, if you let the child know when you're going to make a report and then I'm gonna complicate this even more. With regard to the parenting program, can you speak to what happens if within that family, there's some form of domestic violence, but yet either they're both seeking the parenting program, one is, or that, and that person, because of the domestic violence is somehow limited in what they can safely do at home. So uh, anyone could speak to uh, the, letting the child know about reporting and then maybe Pia, you could give a little bit more information specifically on the parenting program. So in regards to letting the child know, um, I always started, my uh, restorative justice, like community building circles with I am a mandated reporter, right? And so I always was very clear that every adult on an LAUSD campus is a mandated reporter. It's not just me, but you know, we are here to protect you. And we went over what mandated reporters have to do. And I always said, it's part of my job to keep you safe and to keep you healthy. So, you know, and I explained what were certain things that I had to um, speak on or to report just so it was completely clear. Um, if I may really fast speak about uh, PA, LAUSD, sorry, I'm gonna do a plug for LAUSD. We, LAUSD has been amazing on parent groups, virtual parent groups, virtual meetings for children, uh, Northwest especially, we've run, uh, virtual groups for all stakeholder portions, teachers, um, students of all different age groups and parents of, um, and understanding where our parents are and what they need and the resources that they need. That is something that I am really proud of LAUSD for really coming to the aid of our families right now on um, parent meetings. We've been hosting 
parent meeting series in the Northwest on parent self-care. You know, how to build resiliency in your kid, understand that they're trying to be a teenager or, you know, you need to give that space or whatever it is, just really being open. Our parent center directors out in the Northwest have been amazing with um, answering the call of parent needs. So the question about can parents join, Parents can join in LAUSD if you're part of our local district in the Northwest. We put out flyers every uh, month about our meetings coming up and they are throughout the district. That was a lot, sorry. Okay, um, let's go to the second question. Um, do you encounter teen dating violence? And if so, how and what what do you do in response to that? So I, Dr. Bowers, would you like to respond to that? Well, that's an easy one for me because we're in elementary district. So fortunately, we don't have to respond to too much, uh, too many concerns about teen dating violence uh, at our level. However, with that said, we do recognize that we need to be very um, aware of violence, period. Just because we have an elementary district doesn't mean that things don't happen with little ones all the way up because they things do happen. And uh, I think one of the important things and, and many of the other panelists touched on it is building those trusting relationships because at any level we can see when there's concerns, we can see it acted out in the, the child's behaviors. So when we see inappropriate behaviors or we have concerns, we really need to make time and take time to listen and learn and really figure out what's, what is at the core of, of that behavior that we're noticing. Uh, so whether it's teen violence, dating violence, inappropriate behaviors with young ones, because now that we, we do see inappropriate touching or, or displays or different things like that that are concerning. So we have to take the time to ask ourselves, not just focus on the punitive response to the behavior um, and the consequences of the behavior. We want to be sensitive to all parties that are involved, but we also have to be very aware that there, there's probably much more to what we're seeing and observing, and, and we need to try to listen and learn so that we can figure that out and provide the support that that the child needs. Um, and thinking about building those trusting relationships, sometimes that relationship is outside of our circle. So I think the other thing that we can do for our, our children, our young people, our teens, are, is to make sure that they have access to the resources that they need. So if they don't feel comfortable talking to someone within the school system, uh, where are some other resources? Because there are resources in all of our communities that make it very easy for them to access, to talk to someone, to make a report. And we need to let them know that we are not judging. Um, they do have a safe place and a safe person that they may talk to and that there is help available. I think one of the things that Trisha touched on that I really appreciate is oftentimes the kids feel it's their fault, something they did. Uh, oftentimes they want to assume the blame for things going wrong or things changing in their lives and really helping them understand that they haven't done anything wrong. We need to uh, give them the confidence and assurance that making that report, telling someone is the only way that we can get them the help and the resources that they truly need. So if it's not the first time, if it's just sharing resources with them and, and we keep repeating that over and over until we have established that trusting relationship, I think uh, whatever it takes. So I, I'm going to leave the teen dating response specifically to some of my uh, other colleagues that deal with teenagers a little bit more than we have to. And if Can I just add something to what Dr. Bauer said, um, like she said, we don't we don't have a, a high incidence of, of dating violence just because our population only goes to eighth grade, but we do do social emotional learning lessons in middle school that address um, healthy relationships and 
preparing students for um, you know future relationships where they they may encounter um, dating violence and and give them the tools to be able to navigate that situation and realize that it's not healthy and it's not it's not something that they need to be involved with. So I just wanted to add that part. Thank you. And um, before I call on uh, Pia and Trisha, I just wanted to ask also, as you're addressing this question, um, do you have connections to domestic violence focused resources, whether that be teen dating violence um, or other DV agencies to help um, some of the families you're working with? So. Uh, Trisha and Pia, do you, what, what do you do when you encounter teen dating violence and what's um, for you? That has been an uphill battle at MAN. And this is something that breaks my heart because of the fact that we have a high rate of, um, quite honestly, and quite frankly, prostitution in our area, right? So our students a lot of times are emulating behaviors or acting out behaviors that they see in the neighborhood or they see in social media, TV. And um, one of the big things that I love is that during the summer, I get to really work with a select number of students in high school. And um, I remember having a conversation with one of my girls because she was so aggressive with her boyfriend. And so it's like getting down to the root of why are you aggressive? What's going on there? That's, and you know, I actually had that conversation between the two of them. Do you like how she treats you? You know, and the answer was no. But one of the things that I was talking to Christine about that's so important that we do is um, we would have groups. So in my girls group, we would talk about what's a positive relationship? What should it do? How does it make you feel? You know, and so some of the girls were able to express the idea that a positive relationship is one that's gonna be supportive, right? Um, but that's not what they were doing. They were choosing relationships that were super aggressive, super dominating. Um, so we had to get to the bottom of that also. So one of the uh, things that we did is I had a boys group and a girls group. And then at one point when I felt like we could bring them together and actually have a conversation about what relationships look like, right? But it's an uphill battle because we're constantly trying to offset what they see in the neighborhood. When you see the John that grabs the girl on your way to school, as an outsider, I'm sitting here going, well, that's wrong. But it's like, why is that wrong? You know, like, why am I judging what they see on a constant basis? And they believe that that is what a relationship looks like, right? So it's a lot of, I don't wanna say role-playing and having those conversations, but it's a lot of honest, raw conversations with our students about what is acceptable, what's not acceptable. Um, Unfortunately, we did lose a couple of our high school girls to that lifestyle. And so at that point, it's like, what, what can we do, right? And I think the question was, do we have resources to domestic violence? And unfortunately, I'm not throwing any LAPD division underneath the bus, but a lot of our calls went unanswered. Um, so. I am sorry, like, and that's where I re would rely on Christine. Dr. Shen was amazing about getting outside programs in on our campus, but I felt like we were facing an uphill battle that we didn't have the resources because every other department was so inundated in Los Angeles. And I just want to add, and I, I know Pia knows this, you know, man is a small school. We only have 500 students as of this year. When we started in 2016, there's only 290. So when you think about growing a middle school to a high school, you know, with 500, you know that there is no money for these specialized counselors to work with our students. And so um, part of the reason why Trish has left to, you know, she's in a great position now in the district is that our school actually does not have funding for a specialized counselor to deal with the special population of needs and services that our students and families need. And so we are hoping, you know, that next year as our enrollment grows, we will be able to be able to afford um, a specialized person to help bridge and make those connections between our students and our, not just our school stakeholders, but our community and service providers in the area and in the neighborhood for our families. So it's a constant struggle. To and I mean, just, 
Let me just do one commercial for the DV Council. You're invited where you can learn, you can meet many people who provide those services, including human trafficking, all of whom are out in the community who could be of assistance. So please join us. Okay. Thank you. I mean, especially, and Christine brought up a huge point, it's our community stakeholders. So when we were no longer a safe, safe passage school and we lost our own uh, school police officer, our resource officer, we looked to our community and we would have fathers come and stand on the corners to make sure our students were getting to school safely. Because we had those situations where I had a girl run into my office and said, and reported that a man tried to pick her up as she was like walking to school with her little sister. So it was really building those communities with our, excuse me, that, that community trust that we're here. We're a different school site. We aren't the old man you see, our man on um, middle school. We're man UCLA community, you know, so definitely bridging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I also mention that today we started with what a special day this is for our country. But I want to share with you that I think systemically schools being underfunded mm -hmm. and then expected to do such heavy lift. What you're hearing is we are the richest state, right? And, and as an economy without getting too global, we are still funded at $17,000 per student. Whereas New York is, I don't know, in the 30 or 40,000. Our funding in California for each child is dismal and yet we're expected to fund a whole team teachers need a whole team nursing and psychologists and social workers we need that because what we're seeing in our schools this concept of healthy relationships let's not forget that we have had a crisis how people talk to one another in this country for the past four years and so the fact that children are coming into schools and demonstrating unhealthy relationship is no surprise when adults are misbehaving. So um, we can try to do as much as we can, but our children are a reflection of what they're experiencing at home, in their communities, and in their country. So I think we have a tremendous opportunity to together advocate for the proper funding, because it's not just educational and instructional learning, but it's really having the resources to um, buffer and mitigate all the issues children are facing. I want to mention that um, a couple of things were mentioned that uh, we do have a tremendous partnership with the Pritzker Foundation and UCLA, our psychiatric social workers, and now we're training everyone in the division to do focus, which is a curriculum in the classroom where actual social workers come in because again, asking teachers to do social emotional learning, they can do that. But we know that it's effective when people step into the classroom. And so instead of, they still do individual and group counseling, but doing classroom intervention, teaching children how to do um, goal setting and problem solving and talking about healthy relationships is critical so that we put that, that is a skill that is an instructional skill too. Um, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic kind of halted uh, a partnership that I'm very proud of. Um, LA Unified teamed up with Peace Over Violence, which is an entity in LA that has been really addressing um, violence and domestic violence for decades. And we hope to soon um, launch a campaign that's gonna be called Make a Choice. And that is teaching children. And to me, the way I see it, when, when we developed CBITS 20 years ago, it's all cognitive behavior therapy. This, this is really de democratizing um, SEL and healthy relationships for all. So teaching children, almost CBT, I have to make a choice, right? What is my choice? The choice can be as it relates to relationships, as it relates to their age, whatever choices to be thoughtful and not be part of um, a situation that happens to them. So we're gonna teach them to make a choice to be uh, healthy and how they relate to others, how to eat healthy. And so this campaign has been um, something that uh, students have been working in the summer campaign. It's gonna have poetry, it's gonna have art, but again, it's not adults doing to children, but children really lifting campaigns with their voice to saying, I choose to be healthy how I treat others. And so this campaign is forthcoming. And I think our work as we move forward is how do we engage children to lift their voice so that they can set the pace. I love that um, Tricia and Christine and my colleagues, we've been working really hard at this. And yet 
we haven't really engaged our children and our families so that they can be part of the solution. And I think this um, campaign that hopefully it'll come uh, next month, it, it really uh, puts healthy relationships because it's not just about their boyfriend and girlfriend, but it's their peers. It's, it's other racial, uh, we are so diverse in LA. So we need to really acknowledge all the different cultures and all the different languages that are spoken, all the immigration stories and really be healthy how we treat one another. Um, so I look forward to our continued work. I, we, we're, we're turning the page today, but really being strategic about what what are we asking a teacher to incorporate in the classroom? Because in the end, that's an educational mission. Every minute has an instructional uh, minute tied to it. So if we take away from children's math class or literature or English language, which our children are doing dismal in subject matter areas, how are we going to influence their time that they have to play and how they have uh, recreation so that they can learn these skills that are so essential? And they've been missing out on it for uh, almost a year. I mean, that, that is another concept. When we are able to come back together, how do we prioritize um, healthy relationships and re-engagement into our school and our communities in a healthy way? Okay, so we're coming up, unfortunately, on the end of our time. So I want to thank everyone, but are there any uh, sort of final thoughts you have specifically really addressing that link to DV, there's a difference in providing services and support to families where there's no violence at home and families where there is violence at home. So any closing thoughts quickly, sort of? Hi, first of all, I, I just wanna jump in really quickly and um, share thank you to Pia for her comments. And in addition to inviting uh, looking at our families and inviting them to be part of the conversation and part of the solution and educating them uh, in a way that is non-threatening and non-intimidating and without blame, uh, without judgment. I, I think there's also a great opportunity for us to look at ways to invite other areas of our community because there's a large burden that's put on, and it's just getting larger, that's put on school districts and schools to do all of this, in addition to making sure that we're covering language arts, mathematics, science, social studies, and PE. Yes, those, those things are important, but I haven't seen the test that uh, people measure their mental health, their social emotional stability, their uh, relational health. So those things in society are set aside while we say they're important, do we dedicate as much time, attention, and resources to making sure that we nurture those things along the way, from beginning to the end, from womb to tomb? Do we actually give those things the, the attention that it needs? So the opportunity for us to enlarge this conversation outside of just the educational field, I think is important. I think it's timely. I think um, all adults, we all need to really look at how we can better educate ourselves, better communicate and better support our children because things are happening. And if there aren't healthy relationships in the home, in their lives, uh, where not only where are the resources, but what other um, opportunities can be created or accessed by these children to learn these healthy behaviors. So there's, there's organized sports uh, what kind of enrichment programs through Parks and Recs might be offered so that they can learn proper socialization. I will say in our community, which is has a significantly high percentage of low socioeconomic families that we serve, many of our children don't have access to these enrichment experiences um, and they don't have access to see what these healthy relationships um, and opportunities look like and experience that. We have a lack of mental health supports and services and a much greater need in that area. So the school can't be the, the end all be all place for us to, to wrap all of that on top of or layer it beneath and then try and hope 
that we are able to get to the academics at high levels. So, uh, because we won't get to the academics at high levels if we're always uh, concerned about, which we should be concerned about, the social emotional health and well being of the whole child. So, we can talk in different circles about the importance of addressing and meeting the needs of the whole child. And I think we need to do that at every level, at the state level and at the federal level to maybe revisit how we focus our resources, time and attention on supporting all of these things equally and not just uh, measuring everything based on an academic outcome. Thank you so much. That's an excellent point. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Taylor now to um, get some final points and maybe uh, have some of the questions. Taylor? Great, thank you so much, Eve. Really appreciate it. It was so great to hear from all of you. And I think we particularly appreciated the emphasis on the connection between support at school and its extension to support at home. Uh, all of you highlighted that in such a beautiful way. We can't thank you enough for um, really sharing all of your expertise today. Uh, we had quite a few questions coming in through the chat, and I, I actually just want to defer one of them to Pia. A lot of folks were asking about the uh, parenting programming that you're offering and how it can be accessed and whether the parent has to live in the district in order to access it. Yes, I did respond that what we're trying to do is really build the school's community. So there are school specific and it may be that one school teams up with another school. So it is for LAUSD families. I am in close uh, communication always with Echo Parenting. I think that that referral was also put there. So mm -hmm. there are folks from um, different um, school districts. Uh, we can try to help you, but most of the, the parenting programs that we have are school specific. Or, or regionally specific. Great, thank you so much for clarifying that, Pia. And I also wanna give Dr. Bowers the opportunity to uh, just highlight any parenting services that may be accessible to the public uh, as well. Thank you very much. Um, I am actually going to defer that question to Trish and Julie because I know that they work on that daily and we offer a lot of parenting support services through our counseling department. Uh, we also offer care, uh, parenting services through our special programs, which focuses on equity. So we have uh, support in the academic area, uh, support for preschoolers and, and young or little learners. And then we have uh, parenting groups and support for other areas as well. Even during this virtual environment, I know that our um, Lancaster Alternative Virtual Academy has been and our ACES program has been providing some virtual support groups for not only students on the weekends and in the evenings, but support groups for our families. We actually have an academic support group uh, partnership with UCLA where we have some UCLA students that are doing tutoring for us. So we've got a lot of different pieces all over. So a big shout out and opportunity to say thank you to UCLA for that partnership. Trish, you can uh, please feel free to add some more detail about some of the work that our counselors are doing. Yeah, I put. I think I put a link of uh, to our district counseling website that has all of our caregiver trainings and um, recordings on there. So um, you can you can take a look at those. And I, you know, I I direct parents to those trainings all the time when they want to know what do I do to motivate my child in distance learning? And I, I refer them to the website. So um, there's a lot of great, great resources there. Um, we, our department, Pupil Safety and Attendance works very closely with our special programs um, department. And we have family ambassadors that work really hard to pull parents in and make them part of, part of the educational community. And so there's, you know, we, we wanna partner with our parents. Um, and we know that the best results come when um, the families and the educators are working together for our kids. One other thing I just recalled, see when 
I stop talking, I can think. <laughs> uh, we have a welcome and wellness center that does a lot of work in our community, but specifically it's, it's our center. It's not just an enrollment center, but it really does look at the needs of the whole family, not just the child, the whole family. So we have extended partnerships with Antelope Valley Partners for Health here locally, but we also have established partnerships with uh, organizations like Baby to Baby, Family to Family. We've provided um, assistance as far as materials and supplies, not just tutoring assistance and informational assistance, but housing assistance, food, food assistance, um, transportation assistance, personal hygiene assistance. So we recognize again in the Antelope Valley, there is a huge need. And if these needs aren't addressed, then we will see those concerns, those behaviors come out in other areas. So we, we are really trying to um, be supportive at every level from the family, from the parents, uh, all the way out to the children, we provide meals. There are lots of ways that school districts are providing resources. So for all of our audience out there, I would encourage you to connect with uh, school administration to find out where those resources are. If there is a counselor, uh, touch base with the counselor because part sometimes part of the problem is not that they don't exist. It's just that maybe we haven't done a really good job of sharing how to access that information. So I encourage you to reach out and find out if it's available and then perhaps ways to help communicate that better to the families and to staff members. Because if we don't know, then we can't share that information with our families. So thank you again for inviting us. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowers. We really appreciate you connecting the needs of families to a greater likelihood of uh, your disruption and uh, how that impacts kids, particularly and sometimes in the form of domestic violence. Um, I think the point of our conversation today was really to connect how things that happen at home can result in disruption and then trickle down to the classroom. And you all did such a beautiful job of really articulating that and I think what we can walk away with is the idea that support is really critical and uh, that it can come in many forms. Uh, to that end, some of you have been asking about our tutoring. Our student, Brittany, put uh, information about the UCLA Pritzker Center's Bruin Tutor Network in the chat. Uh, this was uh, spurred by our colleagues and friends at the Lancaster School District and we're really excited to extend it uh, to the community. It is specifically for children in foster care or children that are DCFS involved, uh, but we welcome you to learn more about it at the flyer in the chat. And with that, um, I'd like to thank our speakers for their insightful contributions to today's panel. Before we end today's discussion, I'd like to share a few next steps. We are hosting a summit on domestic violence and foster care in May. If you would like to receive notifications about that, you can sign up at the link in the chat. We also invite your feedback on today's event. Please complete our brief survey. This series will continue with one additional session next week. We will be talking about housing and how housing comes up in relationship to domestic violence. Please sign up on our Eventbrite page. Lastly, we invite you to visit us on our website and follow us on social media at UCLA Pritzker. You can also contact me with any questions anytime about any of our programming. Thank you again to all of our speakers and to everyone who joined. We hope to see you next week for our final installation of the series. And thank you again so much for joining us. And let's give our speakers a round of applause. Thank you again. Thank you all so much. Have a great day.